So what we'll be talking about are these things called redox reactions. Basically, we're talking about what happens when electrons move. And there's all sorts of applications from um, batteries and circuits to how our bodies function and how we send electrical signals around. So first, let's do a little bit of general information about this. So redox reactions are what occur when we move electrons from one reactant to another. And the two key things that happen are oxidation, which means the loss of electrons. So if something throws away its electrons, it's being oxidized. Those electrons have to go somewhere. They can't just kind of like bounce around in the ether. So something has to gain them. If something gains electrons, it's called reduced. And it's called that because its charge literally is reduced. If you pull in more electrons, the charge gets more and more and more negative. So we have these other terms, oxidizing agent and reducing agent. An oxidizing agent is something that allows oxidation to occur by itself getting reduced. So whatever um, is reduced, we call the oxidizing agent because it pulls electrons from something else. It allows that thing to get oxidized. Whereas the reducing agent allows reduction um, by itself being oxidized. So the thing that gets oxidized, that gets rid of its electrons, goes up in charge, and then those electrons have to go somewhere, whatever gains them, then goes down in charge. So we have a little schematic here um, in this corner that basically illustrates this idea. We have these electrons here from the reducing agent. The reducing agent gets oxidized and the electrons are transferred over to the oxidizing agent, okay? So a redox reaction is a combination of reduction and oxidation. These things can't take place in a vacuum one has to occur with the other because again, the electrons can't just be sent off into some sort of mysterious ether. So oxidation is loss of electrons, again, and reduction is the gaining of electrons. When we combine these two processes together, we get an redox reaction. So there's a high-tech animation to help illustrate this. So this thing's gonna be reduced, the purple, circle. The blue one is going to be oxidized. There we go. So again, electrons have to go somewhere one more time for good measure. So whatever's oxidized has to give it directly to something else. And there's roughly 8,942 <laughs> mnemonics or um, redox reactions. One of them is oil rig, Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain. That's one way you can think about it. Leo goes grr. Lose electrons. Oxidation. Gain electrons. Reduction. Never plant your corn on a foggy Tuesday. Uh, that's not actually mnemonic, but there's like 8,000 mnemonics for this. They're, they know, they're all good. They have their merit. The way that I like to think about it is if something is gaining electrons, electrons have negative charges. So if something is grabbing more electrons, it's becoming more and more negative. Its charge literally is getting reduced. Okay, so now in order to better understand oxidation, we have to invoke this thing called oxidation numbers. And we looked at formal charge before, and this is another bookkeeping system. It's basically a way of keeping track of where electrons are on a given atom or molecule. So, the calculation for it is sort of similar to how we calculate formal charge, uh, just with one fundamental difference. So with formal charge, what we did was we took the number of valence electrons, let me write this in here, just to show the comparison. So formal charge was where we took the number of valence electrons, And then from that, we subtracted 
the number of non-bonding electrons. Sorry, my cursor disappeared. Oh, well, so the number of non-bonding electrons plus number of bonds. This is sort of a similar idea, except now the number of bonds, we assume that both of the electrons in any given bond flock toward the more electronegative element. So it's just kind of a more extreme approach to formal charge. So for example, let's look at CO2. The oxidation number is, so we look at oxygen, it is in group six. So it has six valence electrons, and then it's got four non-bonding electrons. So it's got the one, two, and three, four here. And then what we do is we look at this double bond. So a double bond has a total of four electrons. And we assume that they're going to migrate toward the more electronegative element. What's more electronegative, oxygen or carbon? One is V electronegative. One, eh, not so much. Which one wins the electronegativity battle here? Let's see what we think. Okay, good. Exactly, oxygen. So what we're gonna do is assume that all four of those electrons are flocking over to the oxygen. So we have a two lone pairs, and we're assuming all four of these electrons are going over to the oxygen. So we get six minus eight, which equals negative two. And just like formal charge, all of the oxidation numbers on all of the atoms have to add up to the overall charge on the molecule. So that's negative two. So with that in mind, Let's do a um, poll here. So which, what is the oxidation number on um, moment of the carbon in carbon dioxide? So let me open the poll. And away we go. Take a moment. And we're doing the top question here. So we want to know formal <laughs> charge on this fellow here. <laughs> we'll give us another 15 seconds or so. Right, so please get your answer in, in five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And let's see what we thought. Okay, so the answer is actually E. So our oxidation number is equal to its group number, which is four. And then there's no lone pairs of electrons, so there's no non-bonding electrons, so that's zero. And then we have these two double bonds, but in both cases, we can safely assume that these electrons are gathered more toward the oxygen than they are 
toward the carbon. So as a result, it ends up being four minus zero plus zero, which is positive four. Okay, so now let's do a little um, way back Wednesday here. What's the formal charge of the carbon and carbon dioxide? So we'll do a poll here. You calculate the formal charge, what does it end up being? So far, five for five, six for six, cool. All right, and let's put in our answers if we haven't done so yet in five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And our answer is nicely done, C. So it's in group four, there's zero non-bonding electrons and four bonds which gives us an overall um, formal charge of zero. Okay, so the thing to appreciate here is that um, oxidation number and formal charge, they both are a way of assigning charge. They both have slightly different utilities. They're two different bookkeeping methods um, and they both do have their own uses. Oxidation numbers is gonna be very useful for seeing how electrons are transferred. And usually we'll see that we have a pretty quick system for figuring out oxidation numbers that we'll do in a few slides. Um, but this is just the formal way that you would go about figuring it out if you were looking at an actual structure itself. So that carbon is plus four and the other oxygen is minus two. And once again, if you add up all of the oxidation numbers, just like with formal charge, you'll end up with the overall charge on a molecule, which for CO2 is zilch. So a number of elements have very common oxidation states that they take place, that they um, will gravitate toward. Here's a whole bunch of them. Whoa, so many numbers. Eh, don't worry about that. This is just like purely FYI here. Here are the rules that we're interested in. And these rules, they're generalizations, but they're generalizations that are always going to work for us. So, um, here are the rules in the order that we use them in. Group one elements in a molecule are always plus one. The reason for that, group one elements are very limited in the number of oxidation states they contain. How many electrons are there, uh, valence electrons are there in anything in the first group? So anything in the first group, Good, just has one valence electron. And it can easily lose that valence electron. Valence electrons can come and go. And for group one, they lose them pretty easily. Um, but if you try to take in more electrons, then you're messing with core electrons and a lesson way back when, we don't do that. We don't mess with core electrons. That's just silly, little cats. So it's a similar idea for rule number two. Group two elements are usually plus two. Fluorine is usually negative one because it's the king of electronegativity. It hoards electrons. It usually has a negative charge unless it's bonded to itself, in which case there is no um, fluorine and fluorine would share electrons evenly. Oxygen is usually minus two and we'll look at one case where it's not. And then again, if you add up all the oxidation numbers in a molecule, uh, they have to add up to the overall formal charge. So let's do a few examples here. And what I recommend doing when calculating these um, oxidation numbers is write individual oxidation numbers above an atom. So I'm going to start with this sulfuric acid over here, this H2SO4. Each hydrogen is plus one. So for every hydrogen in that molecule, it has an oxidation number of plus one. But there's two of them. So total, they have plus two. So I like to put the individual on top 
and then the totals on bottom. Okay. Oxygen is minus two, but there's four of them. So it's contributing a whopping minus eight. And then the last element here, we just need to fill in the missing piece. So this overall molecule is neutral, which means all of these numbers have to add up to zero. So that means that our lone remaining sulfur must be positive six because two plus six plus negative eight equals zero. Yeah. So then we can do the same thing for this um, dichromate ion. Each oxygen is minus two for a total of minus two. All the charges need to add up to negative two though. So that means that the chromium must be a total of positive 12. And since there's two of them, that means that each one is plus six. Okay. And the last one I just wanted to point out, H2O2 is a little bit of an anomaly. With H2O2, we always do group one elements first because they're very um, pigeonholed in terms of what oxidation states they can take. So each one's plus one for a total plus two, which means oxygen needs to be minus two, which means each, each oxygen is minus one. And minus one is an uncomfortable oxidation state for oxygen because usually it's minus two. And what we'll see is that certain elements, certain compounds like to have certain charges. If not, they'll be more reactive. Um, has anybody here used hydrogen peroxide out of curiosity at some point, like poured it on a wound or anything like that? <coughs> Anybody, it's a pretty common antiseptic. Has anybody? Mm hmm Okay. And so you know that when you use it, does, if you pour it onto something, does it just, you know, act like water and just kind of rinse off or does it do something? It bubbles, good. It starts reacting. And so what it actually does is because it is a high energy molecule, it starts to break down and decompose into actually oxygen gas and water. So um, it's because of this unstable negative one charge here. And that's gonna be kind of the idea oh, at moving forward. So using those rules, let's do one more poll here. What is the oxidation state of nitrogen in the nitrate anion here? To the poll, da 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 Take a moment and calculate what is the oxidation state of nitrogen here. Using those rules from the previous page. Okay, if you haven't gotten the calculation in yet, please go. In three, two, one, and zero. The answer is we have a tie. The answer is D. And the way that we would get that is each oxygen is minus two. Although I think I accidentally got these numbers in on the uh, unannotated version. Um, but anyway, this is how we would do it. Um, each oxygen is minus two for a total of minus six. They all have to add up to negative one, which means oxygen must be plus five. And then, um, we're not going to do this one as a poll. This would be similar to hydrogen peroxide. Sodium peroxide is sometimes used um, to help get 
earwax out. So it's sometimes poured into people's ears. It starts bubbling, it builds up pressure, um, but it works similarly to hydrogen peroxide. Each sodium is plus one, oxygen is minus one, and as a result, it is reactive. Okay, so now let's talk about how we write out these reactions. Electrons in a reduction reaction have to come from somewhere. Likewise, the electrons from an oxidation reaction, they need to go somewhere. So they always need to be paired up. You always need to have a reduction paired with an oxidation. So that's where we get the portmanteau of redox from. So here we have an example of iron reacting with acid. If you pour acid onto iron, it is going to corrode pretty readily. So what's being reduced in this case? So if we look at the oxidation state of these things, um, any metal, um, any element in its neutral solids. We are currently experiencing increased call volume due to COVID-19, and PNC recognizes that some of our customers may be negatively affected by impacts of this global outbreak. PNC is committed to helping our customers. If you are experiencing financial the challenges as a working. result, please go to www.pnc.com forward slash hardship assistance, where you can apply for available options. If you are calling for information on temporary here. branch closures or adjusted hours of operation, please search locations on pnc.com or use the locate tool on your mobile app for the most recent update. To get started, please say your user ID or enter it on the keypad. You can also say, I don't have one. Please mute yourself. Why don't I have the power to do that? Okay, um, so everybody knows PNC is taking a Next, please say or enter your pin, or you can say, I don't know it. Dude, mute your mic. You don't want to hear your bank information. I don't think you want to share that with the class. Sorry, that user ID and pin didn't work. Your user ID may be the same as your social security number. So please say or enter your user ID, or you can say, I don't know it. Zoom University. Uh, <laughs> Oxidation numbers. Keeping track of them. How do we do it? Let's look. So anytime you have something, an element in just its neutral state, it has an oxidation number of zero. So up here we have our iron. And our iron has an oxidation number of just zero. Anytime you have an, uh, an ion like H plus or Na plus or Ca2 plus, the oxidation number is just equal to the charge. So in this case, plus one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the left-hand side of the reaction, the right-hand side. We're gonna see what number goes up and what number goes down. So here, the iron went from zero to two plus. So what we say, was the iron oxidized or was it reduced? If it went from zero to positive two, its number literally was increased. But, let's see what we see here in the chat. Whereas, I'm gonna come back and re-annotate this. If we look at the hydrogen here, it has a positive one charge. And then if we look over here, anytime you have a neutral element that's just bonded to itself, it's just zero. So we can see that this number literally was reduced. It went from positive one down to zero. It quite literally got smaller. So what's being reduced here, the H plus. What's being oxidized? Well, the iron, it's going from zero 
to positive two. And I'll write that in again. So any neutral element is just zero and it's going to positive two. Okay, so whatever number gets bigger, that's what's oxidized. Whatever number gets smaller, whichever number is reduced, that's what's reduced appropriately enough. So the reducing agent is whatever gets oxidized, which is the iron, and the oxidizing agent is whatever gets reduced, which is the H plus here. And it allows oxidation by itself getting reduced. So then the final question here is how many electrons are transferred total? So we have two hydrogens. Each H plus goes from positive one to zero. So how many electrons would you say each hydrogen gained? So if each one went from positive one to zero, each one must have gained how many electrons? Each H plus must have gained one electron for a total of two. Whereas the iron went from zero to positive two, there was only one iron, so that means it gave up two electrons. So the two electrons went from iron and went into hydrogen. Are there any questions about this? Any questions, anybody? Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Oh, fine, and you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you very much. You do the same. Thank you. Can you just explain, <clears throat> excuse me, can you just explain why it's two again? I was writing something down when you were talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason why it's two is you can either look at what's being oxidized or what's being reduced. The number of electrons transferred has to be the same in both reactions. And so if we look at the iron here, the iron started off with a charge of zero. There was no charge on it. When it was all said and done, the iron had a charge of positive two. So in order to get a charge of positive two, when it's going from zero, that means it had to kick out two electrons. So those electrons were oxidized from iron. They were removed, they were kicked out. Well, the iron was oxidized because they left. And then if we look at the hydrogen, the hydrogen went from positive one to zero, to a neutral molecule. But there were two hydrogens here. So the other way that you can think about this is that each hydrogen went from positive one to zero, which means each one must have gained one electron in the process. And since there's two of them, that means it was a total of two. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Um, here's some more mnemonics. Um, Again, there's roughly 2,872,942 mnemonics for electrochemistry. Here's two of them, um, Lanox and G Red Cat. I only included this one because um, a professor that I've worked with once um, had this slide and I think it's hilarious. Like, look, it's an entire slide dedicated to an ox and a cat. Anyway, more mnemonics, cool. All right, back to half reactions. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this overall reaction and we're gonna dissect it. We're going to look at what gained electrons and what lost electrons. So if we look here, we have tin, which is SN. Why it's SN, I'm not sure. So we have tin as our reactant with positive two. And then when it's all said and done, it ends up having a charge of positive four. So what happened to tin? Was tin oxidized or reduced if it went from plus two to plus four? Hello. So its number went up, right? And if its number goes up, that means it's actually oxidized. If we look at iron on the other hand, <laughs> if we look at iron, iron went from positive three I didn't mean to cover that up. 
iron went from positive three down to positive two. So the number was literally reduced. I'm just gonna write that in. Number literally reduced. Okay. That's a good way that you can tell if something is being reduced. The number goes down, it's reduced. If it goes up, it's oxidized. So here we have what happens with our oxidation. The tin goes from two plus to four plus, so it must have lost two electrons. On the other hand, our iron went from three plus to two plus, so it must have gained one electron. When we look at oxidation reactions, we almost think of them as having electrons as products, because basically what's happening if something's being oxidized, it's kicking out these electrons. These are kicked out of the tin. Whereas with the reduction, electrons are gained. Now there's a slight problem here with this particular setup. If tin is losing two electrons, those electrons have to go somewhere. The iron is only gaining one electron. So how, what can we do to balance things out here? Because it, if we combine these as written, the number of electrons lost are not equal to the number of electrons gained. So any thoughts as to how we can find a viable solution to make sure that this is balanced out and that the number of electrons ends up being equal? Well, what we can do is double the amount of iron that we have. So if we had two irons going from three plus to two plus, then they could take both of those electrons that were lost. And voila, we have balance. So the overall reaction ends up being when we combine these two together, we have one tin and two irons turn into tin with a positive four charge and two iron two pluses. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Why we needed two irons in order to make sure that this was balanced? We're not going to do much in the, the way of balancing. It's just important to recognize that the electrons have to go somewhere, and so it needs to be even out. The number of electrons lost needs to be equal to the number of electrons gained. Are there any questions at all? OK, so let's do one more example. So here we have a reaction written out. And we have a question. What is the reducing agent in this reaction? The pole. Take about a minute or so. Figure out what's being reduced and what's being oxidized. And then our goal is to figure out what the reducing agent is. And remember the relationship between, once you've identified what's reduced and what's oxidized, remember 
which thing is the reducing agent and which thing is the oxidizing agent. Okay, please get your answers in if you haven't done so yet. In five, four, three, two, one, and zero. Okay, so the question is, what is the reducing agent? And what I like to do whenever I see a question that says, what is the reducing agent? Remember, the reducing agent is actually what gets oxidized. So I like to write in large obnoxious letters, as seen here, gets oxidized, because that's what's happening to the reducing agent. And so the thing that actually gets oxidized is if we look at these atoms, zinc has a neutral charge and then it goes to positive two. So the zinc was oxidized. Whereas the copper went from two plus down to zero, the copper was reduced. Okay. Any questions about that? So the answer was A, yes. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is talk about, basically where we're going with this is sometimes some materials really like to gain electrons, some really like to lose electrons, some are fine just the way they are. So we need to invoke this concept of spontaneity. Spontaneity means something will happen. So in terms of a chemical reaction, spontaneity means that something is capable of going forward, making products to a substantial extent on its own. So it means a reaction will take place. And the reaction might take place very, 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 very slowly, but it will eventually take place. A good example is if you have a sample of uranium-235, it will spontaneously decompose. Its half-life, the time it takes for half of it to decompose, is 4.5 billion years. It takes a long time, but it will happen. So what we're looking at is actually a field called thermodynamics. It tells us, will a reaction happen? The rate at which something happens is called kinetics. So just because something happens slowly doesn't mean it won't happen. If you think about like a ball on a very, very, very like shallow hill, the ball will roll down the hill. It might be slow, but it'll do it. So some examples here are um, a Bunsen burner. Has anybody here ever used a Bunsen burner in like a high school chemistry lab or anything like that? Okay, cool. So basically the idea with a Bunsen burner is it uses methane as its fuel. So it uses CH4 here. It uses oxygen from the air then, and we give it a spark. And once it's burning, does it need to constantly be relit? Do we need to keep adding in sparks to keep it going? And the answer is no, once it's going, it'll keep going. So this is something that's an example of spontaneous. In fact, all combustion at room temperature, um, anything where we set something on, where we set a fuel like a hydrocarbon on fire is spontaneous. So is rusting spontaneous? If you have a piece of iron out and you just leave it to the elements for a while, will it eventually turn into rust? Well, unfortunately, we're not going to do this one as a clicker. Unfortunately, yes, iron has a tendency to turn into rust. And rust is 
this iron oxide here. Okay. So is the reverse of that spontaneous? Will rust magically turn back into solid iron? Actually, yeah, let's do this one as a poll. So, the poll. What do we think? Have you ever seen rust turn back into solid iron? Please get your answer in yet, if you haven't yet, in the next 10 seconds or so. All right, and let's see what we thought. Okay, good, the answer is no. It will not spontaneously happen. If you have a piece of rust, you could give it years and years and years. It's not going to turn back into iron unless you were to do work upon it, unless you were to actually um, facilitate a reaction on it. So the reverse of a spontaneous reaction is not spontaneous. So I want to get you thinking just about real life examples. Most of us have probably utilized table salt. I used table salt last night. Um, so have you ever seen table salt, NaCl, suddenly turn into lustrous sodium metal and give off chlorine gas in the process? So in your experience, have you ever seen this reaction happening? All right, please get in your thoughts in three, two, one, and zero. Ah, bee! Bees are good. Just didn't expect them in my outdoor office. Um, all right, let's see what we thought here. Good, the answer is no, which is good for us because as we're shaking our salt onto, say, a potato, we don't want that salt suddenly turning into, ah, B, I'm trying to do class here. I don't know why I didn't consider this being a possibility. Um, anyway, um, thankfully, it doesn't suddenly turn into solid sodium and doesn't give off chlorine gas, which is poisonous. That'd be bad. Then our baked potato would be poisonous, which we don't want. So this is, not spontaneous. Um, now that being said, this does show us something about sodium and chlorine. Sodium tends to be in its plus one oxidation state. So if we look at sodium chloride, it actually consists of, this is a salt that consists of Na plus and Cl minus, and they're held together through their charges. So sodium likes to be in that plus one oxidation state. It's really stable like that. How often have you walked down College Avenue and gone, wow, that's a nice piece of solid, lustrous sodium metal there? The answer is you haven't because sodium metal, wildly reactive. If you have any sort of moisture in the air, it will um, sometimes with an explosion react and turn into Na+. So a good example of spontaneity, to kind of think about what's happening at the chemical level, a good macroscopic example is a dam. 
So is water going over a dam spontaneous? Most assuredly so. Can this do work? Absolutely. And that's an important part of the chemical and physical world is if something occurs spontaneously, it can be harnessed to do something. So in the case of a dam, you have the water going over. As it goes down, we can exploit the gravity, can turn a turbine, and we can get electricity out of it. So what is the reverse of water going over a dam? It would be pumping water up to the top or taking a bucket and filling it up and walking to the top and dumping it and then walking back down and then scooping it up and then walking back up and dumping it and then for some reason, I don't know why, but anyway, will that, will the water go from the lower area and just go back up to the top and make that sound effect in the process? Oh my no. So in order to do the opposite of something spontaneous, we need to put in effort. We need to put in work. And it's the same thing in the chemical world. Iron will spontaneously rust. It will turn in to that iron oxide, Fe2O3. But rust will not spontaneously turn back into iron. We could use an electrical current to help facilitate that process, but we have to do something to make it happen. So that's the idea behind a spontaneous reaction. If something will spontaneously happen in one direction, that means its reverse process is non-spontaneous. Okay? So just with that in mind, thinking about that, I want to know which of these processes can do work at room temperature. Just as a general poll, this is a, a good thought question. And this is a reaction that we're very, very, well, one of these is a reaction that we're very, very familiar with. From class. So which of these will spontaneously occur? Will water spontaneously turn into hydrogen, gas, and oxygen? Or can we turn hydrogen, gas, and oxygen into water. <laughs> yes, that is the appropriate sound effect that occurs when we do this reaction. This is the reaction that we did most in class. Um, okay, please get your answer in, in three, two, one, and zero. And the answer is, Nice job, B. Now, I do have a, a, a state, a question though. So, but technically, even though, say, so I, the reference was the hydrogen balloons that we've been yeah. talking about. Um, but um, technically, don't we need to start it with a flame first? We do. We need to give it a little spark. But once it's going, um, that's something called activation energy. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but once you give it that, just that little spark, it will go. Um, okay. And the rest it's self -sustaining. of it will react. It is self-sustaining. Yep. Okay. So most reactions need a little push in order to be able to happen. Um, likewise, if you have water in a dam and you have like a little hill there, the water will stay in place. But if you lower that hill, whoosh, it'll go over. It's the same thing with the hydrogen reaction here. Water, however, will not be split, at least at room temperature, into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, that's called electrolysis. Um, it can be done using an electrical current, um, and technically speaking, it can be done at really, really high temperatures. Um, but so as a result, hydrogen and oxygen are what are used to propel rockets because they will do that explosion. It can propel, and that like vapor trail that you see behind rockets is actually the water being formed. Um, from this. So anyway, um, we will stop here um, and then we'll talk more about what makes reactions go. We'll look at some things that like to gain electrons, some things that like to lose electrons. Thank you all as always for your time. Um, I hope that wherever you're at, it's a beautiful day there as well. And I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Have a wonderful day all.